Hello there and welcome back. Today's video is going to be a little bit different, so if it's not quite your cup of tea, tune in next week, we'll get right back to the same old type of thing. But this is a video that I've wanted to make for a long time and one where I hope that it will help out people who were in my situation. I remember very vividly the feeling of being asked what I was going to do after high school and the embarrassment of not knowing what the heck I wanted to do. I really wish that somebody had simply laid it out for me in black and white because typically the people who you were listening to either are your counselors in school or your parents or friends who are all drawing from their own experiences and oftentimes they'll try to push you towards whatever they're into. This is why sons usually follow their father's footsteps if they've owned a business or or they get into the family business or the family trade or whatever it is because usually you feel like you have a little bit of an inside track. Uh, the problem with that though is that it tends to leave out a lot of other options. So what you're faced with is a choice between college and trade school. Now I know there are other options like the military, but we're going to focus on those two for right now because I could draw from my own experience and those are what I can speak to. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how I went from a high school graduate to where I am now, having both a college degree and being a licensed tradesman. Uh, if you want to skip past that and you want to get right to the pros and cons, I will leave a timestamp in the description below so you can go ahead and check that out. Now, the reason that I want to tell you about my career history is because I think that it's going to really reverberate with some people who are younger, who were in my position. So we're going to get through it really quickly. This is where it began. Right after high school, I was talking to counselors and stuff like that, and I applied to colleges because that's what everybody else around me was doing. And basically, all my counselor said was computers. Go into computers. That's the wave of the future. Everything's going to be run by computers. We're talking about the very end of the 90s here. So they were right. Everything has gone to computers, but I really wasn't into computers. What was I into? I was into making music. I was into art and drawing and stuff like that. Um, I, there really wasn't anything that struck my fancy, and I wasn't a very studious kid. I wasn't getting, like, straight A's. I was somewhere in the middle of the class. I also wasn't a huge fan of the educational system. So I was just going along, kind of following the motions that everybody else was doing around me. I was applying to colleges. I ended up getting into my college of choice, but then, unfortunately, was faced with the realization that I wasn't going to be able to afford it. There was just no way that I could go. It wasn't a local school. I would have to travel, room and board, all that stuff. It just wasn't in the cards. So in order to save a little bit of money, I said, all right, well, I can go to a local community college. Maybe get the first two years out of the way that way. And that's what I began to do. Now, here's what was interesting. I came from a town which had a great public school system. I mean, we were in like Newsweek and stuff like that, and they are regularly listed among the top uh, public schools in the U.S. So I went from this wonderful, supportive environment to a community college which had a bunch of people from different walks of life who really didn't care whether you passed the class or you didn't pass the class. After all, that's part of the, the transition to college is really making your own way. And it was a bit of a culture shock. So I still, I went ahead, I took the classes that I, I needed to take, and in the meantime, I worked during the day, or whenever I could, at a local mechanic shop. And I started learning to be a mechanic down there. It wasn't too long that I started realizing that I actually liked the feeling of having some money in my pocket, rather than my time taken up by pointless projects and homework and all that stuff. So I said, what the hell? I'm going to go down here. I'm going to work full time. I'm going to make some actual money and go ahead with that. So I did. I learned to work on cars. I got my class A CDL so I could do heavy duty tow truck driving. But I remember very vividly the, the moment that I realized I couldn't stay in that that profession anymore. I went to a, a tow truck class and I remember the guy who was speaking, the guy who was teaching the class. He was an engineer and he invented some sort of new thing. I don't know, some doodad that you used to tow the truck with. I don't remember that, but I do remember what he said. He looked at us all and he said, well, you know, if you guys have read, I know you're probably not big readers, but if you've read in Newsweek or blah, 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 that statement right there, I was a big reader. He didn't know me, but that was enough for me to say, I don't want to be perceived this way. Now, it was one guy's perception. That was one guy looking at a bunch of people and making a judgment on them. And it wasn't everybody. Not everybody looks at mechanics that way or trades people in general. But I started looking at it a little bit more closely. I started saying, well, what's the career path here? What can I do? Eventually own my own garage? 
You know, most of the dealerships are fixing their own cars now. Long story short, I realized that that wasn't the career path that I wanted to go down. So after one very frustrating day at work where I was just angry at the world, angry at where I was, kicking myself for not having the same opportunities to go to college and afford to go where I wanted to go, just being angry, I decided to leave work and I drove straight to the local tech school to speak to one of their counselors. And I decided in that meeting right there that I kind of was into electrical technology. I could be an electrician. It seemed cool, seemed like it was a pretty clean job, especially compared to crawling under trucks. So that's what I did. That night, I signed up for the electrical technology program. Fast forward several years, I had done my four-year apprenticeship. I completed the, uh, the educational requirements. I was ready to sit for the licensed journeyman test in the state of Connecticut, and that's what I did. Passed on my first time. Now I was a licensed electrical journeyman. I could do whatever I wanted to do. So what I did is I kept on working at that job, kept on going, ran a crew, ran a few more jobs, began to kind of climb the ranks a little bit. And then I started again feeling that itch. Like I, I, I wanted to know where else I could go. I was beginning to feel like I was kind of coming up against the ceiling again. So I dug a little bit more. I talked to my boss. I said, you know, what about project management? What if I got into managing that side of it? And he said, well, you know, project managers, they're kind of a thing of the past. That really doesn't exist anymore. I, I think you should stay here. And so I said, okay, well, I see where your interest is at. Of course, it's his own business. So I went back to state school. I found some state schools which offered classes at night so I could complete my degree. And that's what I did. I went back at night after working a full-time job and I completed my degree. So now I have a college degree and I'm a licensed tradesman. So I decided to go ahead and apply for an assistant project manager position, which I got. So I was into the office finally. After doing the field stuff for so long, which I again enjoyed, I was interested to see the other side of it, the money side of it. All the things that my bosses would complain about, I was getting to see how that actually worked. So it was very interesting. And that brings us to today. Now I've worked for a couple of different companies, but I finally got into construction management as a whole. And I really, really enjoy it. Nowadays, um, I've done jobs like a brand new resort casino. Um, I've worked on the railroad. We've done substations, uh, all kinds of very interesting stuff electrically. Places that I'd never thought I would go, things that I would never imagine that I would see. I'm very grateful. So now as I stand here and I have finally come through all of this to get to this point, what would I tell that kid who is frustrated, angry when I was younger, just like that? Uh, that's what we're going to go into here. So here we are. We're going to go through the pros and the cons that I see from my perspective of trade school versus college since I went through both. Now, I didn't go through the, the full college experience of four years away from your parents and partying and drinking and all that stuff. Mine was a little bit different. But still, I got to see the pros and cons of both. And having worked in both a blue-collar job and a white-collar job, what the differences really are. Because I think that I have some unique insight that unless you've really worked for an extended amount of time in either, you wouldn't really see. So let's get to the pros and the cons of college versus trade school. Now, the first thing that I want to say here is that it's a crime that more high schools aren't pushing kids who are cut out for a trade job into trade schools. Do not try to force a square peg into a round hole if this kid is clearly more geared towards that type of life. Unless you really enjoy education and, you know, the rigors of going through it, the educational system, the way things work, Maybe college isn't the way for you. Maybe you're one of those kind of people who's really good at problem solving, who gets a lot of enjoyment out of helping people or building things. There's a lot of different trades you can go into. Of course, my background is construction, so I'm going to speak to that. But still, it's really too bad that more high schools don't consider trade school a, a viable option and an and equal to college, because I really do see that it is. So what are some of the benefits of going into the trades? Well, number one, you can earn while you learn. If you go into college, you're not earning anything, maybe a part-time job just to pay your room and board or whatever it is. You're not really earning a lot, especially in your chosen field until at least four years later. And that's if you get a job right out of college, which most people don't do. With a trade, however, you're earning 
as you're working. So you're learning and you're getting paid. And the way tradespeople kind of look at this is that it's a loan. It's a loan that you pay back over the lifetime of your career with your knowledge and the way you pay it back is by teaching others. So you're earning a wage. When I started off, now this is a while back, but still, I made $13 an hour as a first year fresh off the, you know, assembly line electrician. That that was the deal in Connecticut at the time. You were required to be paid half of what a journeyman or a licensed electrician, in other words, is paid. So I would start off at $13 an hour. It wasn't long that I was bumped up to 14, 15. And I think I was making about $18 an hour in my third year as an apprentice. But either way, I was earning money. I was learning stuff. Finally, then I sat down for my licensed uh, uh, or my licensed exam. So you don't do that in college, but in trade school, you absolutely do. You earn while you learn. Now, there is an educational component to most skilled trades, and I know this applies to x-ray technology and other things in the medical field, but on average, you can expect to pay about $33,000 for your trade school diploma, which is a heck of a lot less than four years at college. So the educational costs are far less, and in a way, they're a little bit better because you don't have all those prerequisites which don't seem to have anything to do with your major, you are just laser focused on whatever it is that you're going to be doing. A very intensive approach, which is really nice because you're learning exactly what you need to learn to do your job right. Let's talk a little bit about benefits. If you decide to go the union route, the benefits can be very, very good. I know the IBEW, the benefits are excellent. And that's something that's very hard to find out there. Even in normal nine to five, just regular jobs, benefits seem to be just dying off. And in today's gig economy, where people just do little jobs here and there, and they're kind of working for themselves, benefits are basically non-existent. It's kind of nice to be able to know that you can have medical coverage and optical coverage and all the things that come with a decent benefit package if you get into a good union. Here's something that I didn't realize would be a benefit until I got into a white collar job. You have a higher degree of activity throughout the day. So you're actually working, you're moving, you're doing things. For me, it was up on ladders, running wire, uh, laying conduit, all kinds of stuff throughout the day keeps you active, keeps the weight off. And just at the end of the day, you feel physically exhausted and you go to sleep and you sleep great. Now, sitting in a chair all day, looking at a computer screen, it's kind of odd. Sometimes I'll come back and I'm like, I didn't do a thing didn't actually physically perform a thing. There's a certain reward to feeling tired at the end of the day. I really kind of miss that. And there are days where I'll come home and I'm like, boy, I gotta hop on the treadmill for like an hour just to, just to get the blood moving. The uh, degree of physical activity throughout the day, it really helps, especially since uh, living a sedentary lifestyle, coming home, sitting on the couch from the job that you were just sitting at, looking at a screen, it's just not good for you. So a higher degree of physical activity, I see it as a benefit. There is also a very real sense of accomplishment. Like I mentioned earlier, if you look back and you see the lights turn on in a big old building that you worked on and you get to see the fruits of your labor, you get to see it come to life. It's an extremely rewarding thing. To wrap up this list of pros for trade school, it's very hard to outsource these jobs. When it comes to building or it comes to anything you have to physically do, it's very difficult to outsource that. Now, you know, you can argue that almost anything can be automated, right? Things are going to come along, machines, robots, stuff like that are, are going to happen. But you're still going to need people to operate those robots and those machines. Now, we're talking years in the future. For right now, you can't outsource it. Of course, there are some drawbacks and things that you won't enjoy that people in white collar jobs do enjoy. Number one is it relies on your physical ability to work. Now, this may not seem like a problem to you younger guys, but as you get older, you realize that your body is wearing down, that things start to ache in the morning that didn't ache <laughs> the night before. You know, that's just the way things happen. It's a wearing down process. And unfortunately, if you break a leg, if you have severe back or neck injuries, it may really affect your ability to earn a living. Myself, I had a back problem uh, about 10 years ago and it put me out for almost a month. It was terrible. And just knowing that if my back goes and I can't earn a living, then this is all for nothing. And what am I gonna be able to do? It relies on your physical ability to perform the work and that sometimes can be a very scary thing. Number two really depends on where you work, but in my experience, you have a, a lack of freedom as a blue collar worker. 
your breaks are scheduled and very rigid. You're supposed to be there at seven o'clock on the dot. Your break is from nine to nine fifteen. Your lunch is from twelve to twelve thirty. You go home at three thirty. That's it. And there's sort of a, a constricting feeling to that. A feeling like you are being you're, you're paid slave labor in a way. That's the way it felt like to me, especially looking around and seeing people who were going out to lunch and enjoying themselves, and we're sitting there on our toolboxes or on your, your bucket or whatever, and you're eating lunch in the break room, if you're lucky enough to have a break room or on your tailgate or sitting on a pile of boards or whatever it is, it's sort of, you basically have a little bit less freedom. Number three sort of ties back to number one in a way, and that is that you have a higher chance of getting injured. If you're performing work, well then you have a much more real chance of getting hurt on the job. So if you're swinging a hammer, there's a chance that that hammer is gonna go into your finger. Or if you're driving a truck, there's a lot of different things that can happen when you're physically working. Now, you can make the argument that sitting on your butt all day is really bad for your heart and bad because you're not actually moving. But the fact of the matter is, is that OSHA exists. All these things exist for a reason. You have a much greater chance of getting injured if you're actually working with your hands. This next one may not apply to everybody, but there is a certain lack of sophistication. And what I mean by that is not the way you speak, the way you dress, although those things all kind of come with it. But I mean the fact that if you have to go to the bathroom, you're going to be going in a little blue hut. Now, if it's really, really cold and you've got to drop trow and go in there and do your business, well, that's just too bad. That's the way it is. And there have been plenty of times where I've had to do that. Or in the sweltering sun and the guy just... He, he forgot to empty the porta potties that day, and that thing's full. It's a pretty nasty thing. If you've ever been to a festival or any place that you have to use uh, portable toilets, it, it, they're pretty gross. And that's what you have to use on a regular basis. There's no office bathroom where you have a, a real toilet and all that stuff. None of that exists. You have these places, and sometimes they even put in little sanitary things so you can, you can kind of clean your hands after, and those last about a day until some idiot either just uses up all the stuff or opens it up and takes the bag out, or they get vandalized or whatever it is. It's not a good place to be, and oftentimes, I know that I do this, you kind of just wait till you get home to do your business. The other thing is, if you want to take lunch, you're going to be sitting wherever you can sit. Now, this may be in your truck or in your van or it may be on your tailgate or it may be on a concrete stoop. Wherever you're working, you just bring your pale lunch in with you and you eat out of that. Now, you get used to it. You know, over time, you do get used to it. And sometimes we'll send an apprentice on a coffee run so you actually have um, hot food if it's really cold out, which is kind of nice. But you don't have the the sophisticated uh, sitting at a table like a normal human being having your lunch or break. You have to do it wherever you can. And to some people, that could be a turnoff. Now, this final one is the perception of blue-collared workers. There are definitely people who give us a bad name. You know the guy, the guy who's in front of you at the you know coffee shop, and he's loud and he's rude and he smells weird and he's just you know he's not put together and you know one shoe is kind of hanging off, that kind of person. But those people exist in life no matter where you go. But there's definitely a perception of construction workers. I know that for sure. Okay, so maybe a college degree is more up your alley. Let's go over some of the pros of having a college degree and working a quote-unquote white-collar job. The first thing, when you're looking at colleges, when you're trying to decide your degree, you have a much wider selection of things to choose from. So you can go into the medical field, you can go into law, you can go into liberal arts. There's a lot of different things you can do. I mean, enough that I couldn't even begin to list them off. I can probably go through most of the things in a trade school, but when it comes to colleges and all the different things that you can major in and all the different career paths, I couldn't even come close to scratching the surface. So you have a much wider selection of different career fields if you decide to go to college. Now this does vary greatly, but as I mentioned before in the drawbacks for blue collared workers, usually if you have a white collar job, you have access to things like a real bathroom or things like a a cafeteria in the bottom of your building that you can go to or the ability to be a salary worker and make up your own hours or even work from home. Those are all things which are just unknown to blue collared workers. And there's something that's a real benefit, which most people, they just get used to and they don't see how, how really nice it is to be able to use a warm bathroom in the middle of January. Number three really depends on who you are again, but you get the college experience, going away for four years and hanging out with your peers, meeting new friends, meeting the people of the opposite sex, having fun partying or whatever it is. 
a lot of stuff like that comes with the college experience and that growth that happens from being away from your parents for the first time. That can't be overlooked. There is a certain degree of, of independence which comes from that. And that's unfortunately something that you do not get in trade school since you go straight to work after. This is unfortunately something that can only really be afforded by the people who can afford to go to school or you're taking out student loans or whatever it is. Uh, and that's just something that happens. That's just the way it is. But if you want the college experience, there's only one way to get it, and that's go to college. After you graduate, you also have the option of going even higher and pushing your income even higher so you can get your PhD or go for your master's. There are a lot of different options available to you, but unfortunately, they do require you to have a bachelor's degree before you can go into those post-secondary forms of education. And then you really are pushing your income way higher. I mean, people who have a PhD, um, you know, the different statistics about people who earn what, usually it's commensurate with the level of education that they have. So the only way to crack into those higher levels of education is by having your uh, undergrad done. Finally, there are certain life skills that you actually learn in college, which you do not learn when you go into trade school or out in the, the field working. And what I mean by that is I took classes in accounting. I took classes in public speaking. I took a lot of prerequisite classes, which I really didn't think that I would need, which I ended up using down the road. Now, there are definitely a bunch of prereqs, which I did not need and I completely forgot and I never use. But things like speaking and writing and doing your own taxes or whatever it is, those are things that do not go out of style. And unfortunately, they seem to be things that are sort of overlooked in the high school uh, curriculum. So you only really get those in college. And they're things that I think are very useful in real life. Now, there are definitely drawbacks to college, no doubt about it. And the first thing that I would say is that, unfortunately, you don't earn a penny until after you graduate. Until you get that ticket punched, you can't really work in that field. Now, I know there are, you know, work programs and you can intern and stuff like that. But I'm talking about real earning wages, 40 hours a week starting in your career. When you're in trade school, you begin from day one. When you're in college, you don't begin until after year four. And that's a significant time. I mean, think about what you could do with four years of even starting wage salary. That's quite a bit of money and quite a bit that sets you ahead. It gets you started and gives you some earning potential and the opportunity to get loans or, or anything like that. So unfortunately, you're, you're kind of limited to only working unless you know somebody in the field who will help you out. But unfortunately, usually with the workload of college and everything like that, it's very difficult to hold down a full-time job and go to school full-time at the same time. And uh, that's just a very difficult thing to do well. Number two is those terrible prerequisite classes that don't have anything to do with your major. Nothing to do with it. I took biology. Sure, it was interesting, but I never, ever use it. And I had to do labs and all that stuff. And it was very expensive because there was all kinds of like little hidden costs, all kinds of stuff that you had to take, which had nothing to do with my major. And that's plenty of people can tell you that that's the case. And the argument usually is, well, we want to make a more well-rounded individual. Really? By having me know that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, that does me a, a world of good in my field. Come on. I mean, these prerequisite classes, a lot of times I feel they're only there to fill up the classes, which normally wouldn't get a lot of students. No surprise here, college is expensive. Matter of fact, it's on an average for a four-year degree in the U.S., $127,000. Compared to $33,000 for a tech school degree uh, or, you know, diploma, that's a lot of money. And now, yeah, sure, you can get help and there are Pell Grants and there are other different ways that you can get scholarships or maybe your parents can help you out. Or uh, worst case scenario is that you take out student loans and then, you know, you go ahead and pay that off basically for the rest of your life. But doesn't stop there. There are plenty of things to buy. So there's room and board if you decide to go away. There's books. If you buy the books, the, I don't know what they make these books out of that makes them so expensive, but I've paid hundreds of dollars for a book that I've used for only a semester and it I, I can't bring myself to get rid of it. So it sits on a shelf and then they change the edition. So the one that you have is no longer, it's no good. You can't sell it to somebody because that's not what they're using the next year. It's a very frustrating thing and college is a very expensive proposition. Four years is a long time. So the career field that you chose could be obsolete or it could be very scarce. And especially if you go into something like, think about if you went into broadcasting and you wanted to get onto the radio, most people don't listen to the radio these days. Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, you're watching me here. So there's plenty of uh, jobs, which unfortunately you can still major in now and they'll be happy to take your money and give you a degree. But once you get out, 
There's no jobs in that field. And that seems to be the way it goes a lot of the time. You know, you get a job or you get a degree in something that you're really interested. Unfortunately, that field isn't hiring. And number five is the dropout rate. Now this really applies to people who are in college or if you're looking to go to college. Overall, there's about a 40% dropout rate. Now this includes community colleges, four-year colleges, basically the entire college umbrella has about a 40% dropout rate. Now, part of this is because it's sometimes people's first time away from home and they can't quite hack it. Or people realize that halfway through, they just can't afford it. Or they're going through and that very intense and demanding academic expectation is too much for them and they have to drop out. So it's about a 40% dropout rate. At which point, what do you do? I mean, that's a terrible place to be. And I was there. I left college. I started. I took a bunch of classes, paid a bunch of money, and then became a mechanic. Used absolutely none of that, that education. Now, the good thing is that, like me, you can go back. You can finish what you started, and then even more if you want to. But the 40% dropout rate, that's pretty scary. So in the end, you have to do something after high school. You can get along, and there are plenty of stories of people who have done very well for themselves with a high school diploma, but they are the exception and not the rule. It's in your best interest to do something after high school because it's very difficult to make any kind of money without that, unless you're a very successful entrepreneur. And let's face it, you might as well just play the lottery because the odds are basically the same there. But if you're looking to go to college, if you're that kid who's 17, 18, 19 years old, and you're faced with that daunting question of, what are you doing after high school? Well, now at least you have a few more things to think about. When it comes to earning potential with either, I know people who are blue collar workers who are making six figures. I know people who are white collar workers who are barely scraping by. So don't let anybody tell you that there's nobody money to be made, uh, you know, swinging a hammer or, or wiring a house or whatever it is. There is earning potential there. If you're an underachiever, you're not going to do well in either. But if you're somebody who's really hungry for it, I'll give you a great example. The COO of my company, okay, hundreds of million dollars a year, he worked his way up from a laborer. He worked in that company, worked his way up. The opportunity is there. So hopefully if you're in that position or if you're considering a second career, you know, halfway through your life, well, I hope that this was a little bit of help to you. Again, guys, I know this is a little bit of a different video, but if you stuck with me this long, I sincerely appreciate you watching, and I am very interested to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you very much, and I'll catch you next time.